Hi, uh, Ajahn. So, uh, in the previous two suttas, right? Yeah. One sutta uh, mentioned for liking and disliking, we should uh, we should look at it as uh, its condition, its cause. And mm. the next sutta, we, we should like reason reason out uh, why this is the sensual pleasure or whatever the desire actually yeah, yeah, is yeah. Uh, bad to us, right? Yeah. Uh, but in my experience. Um, I think, for example, like a person who is keep, keeping fit, is trying to avoid the desire of eating good food, right? So, it, yeah. the person should already know that, okay, this, uh, this good food actually leads to a bad health. It's actually not a long... Because you, can, you cannot keep on eating for long, right? So, it's, it's a temporary... Uh, can you hold the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth? Uh, Hard, yeah. yeah. Hello? Yeah, good, yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. yeah, so I was saying okay. that yeah. uh, in my experience, um, I feel like, for example, a person, I'm thinking like a person who is keeping fit, then... Keeping fit? Yeah, keeping yeah, fit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so he's, yeah. he's trying to resist the desire of getting good food, right? He knows that the good food will bring uh, bad health. Yeah. He knows that the good food only lasts for this long. You cannot keep on eating it. But still, it's not like straight away uh, blinking of an eye that you can uh, get rid of the, the, the desire, even you know that this, this two are. So my question yeah, is, like, yeah. is there any lacking yeah. that uh, we can really use the wisdom power without any willpower? To... I, I, you know, when it comes to food and things, I wouldn't be too, too worried, to be honest with you. I, <laughs> It's such a small thing, yeah, yeah. Enjoy your food, that's what I say. But, um, ah, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Father Christmas has been here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> or maybe it's Mother Christmas, I'm not sure. Maybe. <laughs> I, I think sometimes we take these things too seriously. You know? That's what I meant before about seeing the difference between lay people and monastics. Even monastics enjoy their food. I can assure you I enjoyed my food, especially here at the BF. People, you know, the food we get is wonderful. I just had a beautiful meal before here, but all the offerings of everyone. And uh, I often prefer just to rejoice in people's generosity and uh, enjoying the, what they give. My concern is not so much about enjoying the food, it's more about not eating too much. That is what I'm concerned about. If I eat too much, it's going to have very bad consequences. I can't talk afterwards, right? I fall asleep. Of <laughs> <laughs> There's a nice story about that one. You know the story? There's a story someone told about the, this monk who was, uh, it was a monk in Thailand. Uh, and usually they had these talks that went all night. I don't know why they had that, but they had talks that went all night. Uh, and, uh, and this monk, he was uh, sitting there talking on, on the Dhamma seat, uh, and then he would uh, uh, talk and talk and talk, and, and uh, he'd fall asleep while he was talking. That's pretty relaxed, right? He told him while he was sleeping, okay. And then he would wake up again, and he'd just carry on exactly where he stopped before he went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm hard to believe. But I think maybe, I don't know, maybe he had some kind of illness or something. But uh, the point is more, you know, one of the things they have in the suttas, they talk about sati sampajanya, the uh, situational awareness. Uh, and when it comes to food, it is about knowing the right kind of food, knowing the amount of food, uh, this sort of thing, the right quality of food. Uh, so it is not, you know, we shouldn't be too concerned about enjoyment of food. That's a very small thing. In fact, if you don't enjoy your food, very likely to have a miserable life, to be honest with you. It's one of the highlights of life for most people is the food we eat, right? It's actually a very important part of life. Yeah, I mean, uh, the food is only one example, but I mean, it applies to like attachment to iPhones or uh, yeah. attachment to praises yeah. from others, people to yeah. others. So, so we know these sure. kind of things are like not long-lasting, we know yeah. that after a while it fades off. Yeah. Or even like iPhone, we yeah. get eye shots, we get like, uh, yeah. and we know that it is meaningless, scrolling the Facebook yeah. is meaningless. Sure. But Not still we indeed. are yeah. attached to it. Yeah. Like, there is yeah. no yeah. Uh, wisdom power that like, can get rid of it. Like. There is. A, <laughs> there is. A, yeah. How? how you, you, just, you just have to develop. Throw it away. Throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> You have to develop, you have to develop it, uh, and, and it happens over time. But when it comes to certain things like iPhone, it's incredibly addictive, yeah? very, very addictive. Uh, it's like a drug, you know, I mean, let's face it. Uh, 
And so what you have to do, you have to take some, some actions that actually block that addiction from being able to uh, live itself out in an ordinary way. So you have to say, okay, after a certain time in the evening, I'm going to put it in a safe, I'm going to give it to my family member, they lock it up somewhere, I can't get access to it until the next day, next morning, for example. Yeah? You have to do something which makes it almost impossible for you to use it uh, at certain times. Uh, or at the very least, maybe there's some, some kind of self-locking mechanism that locks it off after a certain time or whatever. You need to do something which makes it impossible to access it. It's like if you are a smoker, you want to quit smoking, don't have cigarettes in your house, right? If you have cigarettes in your house and you're a smoker, you're doomed. You have to kind of make it difficult for yourself to get hold of cigarettes. Otherwise, it's going to be too easy because it's incredibly addictive. This says a bit like heroin addiction to be addicted to cigarettes. So you have to kind of make strategies that make it hard to get access to that thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the, that's the, that's the, the trick here. You have to understand the limits of your own willpower. You don't have that willpower because you haven't got it. Make it difficult for yourself. Then you can't do it. Yeah, so this is kind of the, how you deal with uh, with iPhones. Uh, uh, with food, I wouldn't worry. I, 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 food is only a problem if you think about it in meditation. Yeah, that's when it's, it's a problem. Uh, otherwise, no issue. Yeah, no, no problems at all. Uh, and uh, attachments to what was the last thing you mentioned? There was one more thing you mentioned. What was that? Uh, Praises. Praises and blames. Yeah, well, praise and blame is what I usually remind myself is that most people in the world are clueless anyway here. <laughs> they, don't, they don't know what to praise, right? They don't know what is praiseworthy here. Yeah. People think if you get praised for some silly, superficial thing, who cares, yeah? And that's what people praise you for. They praise you for nothing, for things that are irrelevant, or they praise you to manipulate you. Praise is a very good way of manipulating people, yeah? If, you, if a boss wants you to work well, a smart boss will praise you rather than blame you. Yeah. Then you feel, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then you work even harder, right? So, yes, it's the job's, bo job's to praise you, because that's what boss, boss, good bosses should do, and it's your job not to take that praise too seriously. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. So, what you, what you should do, the kind of praise you should listen out for, is some, it, when someone like Ajahn Brahm praises you, huh? yeah? he says, oh, you're living well, you're doing well, that's what you should be concerned with. If the Buddha praises you, wow, then you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? <laughs> That's what matters because they understand what is really praiseworthy in this world and what is blameworthy here. Most praise and blame is pretty empty here. Yeah, it doesn't really mean very much. Uh, so who cares if <laughs> people praise? So th this is what I mean by wisdom, right? And, and, the, and, and by uh, understanding, develop these ideas. Uh, and it doesn't take that long before you... Praise and blame is actually quite easy to get rid of. Uh, it's not that, that, that problematic, uh, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the good questions. So, yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn. Yeah. Um, I just like to. Um, I would like you to explain a little bit about um, the Sutta saying uh, we should not do, uh, get too caught up in the spe specific characteristics of the, our, the sight, the objects of sight, and all this. Um, by specific objectives, is it in contrast with the common characteristics, the three laksana, or yeah. even that is we are looking at the, ob the characteristic object, uh, is it possible that we turn inward and look at how, what motivates us to be attached to this object? Let's say, for example, our mm. fear of death or miss out some excitement. You know, we want to have an more and more excitement yeah. because there's a fear of uh, death behind us that we will lose everything. That's why we are keep attaching. So I, I think I'm, I'm not so sure whether we should be like looking at both sides, both the common characteristic and also turn inwards to look at why we are attached to this? Yeah, I, I, yeah. So the the uh, the, sut, the uh, sutta on sense restraints. It talks about the uh, you know being uh, grasping the nimitta or the vyanjana, and the uh, vyanjana is like the uh, character, the minor characteristic. The nimitta is the entire object usually. So what, the point there is just that. You know, when we um, see something or hear something, you can grasp the entire field of what you're seeing, or you can grasp some minor aspect of it. And it doesn't really matter. Whatever you grasp in that, within vision or hearing uh, is really included in this. Uh, and uh, so that's the kind of the first part of your answer the with the characteristic. The second part is, yes, it is in exactly our response that is important. Uh, because things in the world don't really have anything to them in itself, that is either attractive or unattractive, is how we respond to that is important. Uh, 
So absolutely, and you can, you should indeed investigate why is it that you respond the way you do here. And you are right, sometimes the fear of death can be one of the factors that makes you respond in a certain way, right? That fear. So what you should do with death, you should, instead of having a fear of death, you should turn it into a wholesome contemplation here. That reminds you of, you know, time is short, you know, I, now is the chance to kind of live well, to do the right thing here. And so fear of death can be turned into something very, very beautiful and, and nice. You know, one of the things of overcoming the fear of death is just to remind yourself that uh, good people have good results. Uh, yeah, good things happen to good people. Uh, this is one of those things that is very simple antidote to all the anxiety and fear that you see in the world. People are fearful of climate change, of environmental disasters, of wars, uh, and uh, you know, sh fair enough. You know, how, how could you not be a little bit concerned about it? I mean, things are going badly in many places. Uh, but the antidote is that if you're a spiritual person, if you live well, you're always going to have a good future regardless. Your future is not so much tied up with what happens in the external world. And fear of death is also about the external world. It's the same thing as the fear of climate change, fear of wars, fear of death. All of that is one group of things which all comes together. Or the fear of death of other people or yourself or whatever it might be. All of that is counteracted by living well and by understanding that good people have good results. Yeah? That's kind of the critical thing here. And so uh, that is what, um, to my mind, uh, matters. And uh, you attach to other people, maybe you attach to other things because of fear of death. But actually, if you have fear of death, you should not attach. You should do the opposite. Uh, yeah? You should actually let go because uh, the fear of death actually this, you know, makes it worse in many ways. Uh, have I, we, I, I'm not sure if I've really answered your question, so would you like to try again? Uh, I have a feeling I haven't really touched on exactly what you were getting at. Uh. Uh, yes, uh, maybe, maybe I didn't put it clearly. What I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, most of the time we are caught up with the specific details, so it's all oh, this very good because they have these characteristics and all this. Um, then when they say that uh, not too caught up in the specific details, uh, of the whatever we see and all this, um, does it imply that we should actually examine their common characteristics, as in the three, uh, three characteristics, uh, suffering, uh, non-self, and emptiness? Uh, or, or even that it is also, it's still looking at the object's characteristic. Do we need to go a bit further and turn our attention backward into why our, our mind, why our, uh, we, our mind have this tendency to right. attach to the object, like analyze it, it is, uh, let's say, if you realize that it is because of the fear of death that you don't want to miss out any experience that's interesting, mm. then you will say, oh, this is a trick played by the mind, mm. Mm. and then you just drop it. Yeah, so the, the, so the specific, I mean, the specific uh, characteristics and the general characteristics, uh, yeah, so specific address, it just means that you're attaching to something in the object, uh, and so you are seeing it in the wrong way. You're seeing it uh, in terms of happiness and permanence and self rather than the other way around. Uh, so this is, this is uh, true for everything, yeah, whether this is whatever it is that you see and, and, and look at, uh, the three characteristics of, of existence are always the three ways you should look at that thing with, uh, through, through that lens, uh, yeah. So you see something uh, beautiful in something, then you remind yourself, actually, maybe it's not, uh, you know, we see something permanent, it's not permanent. Uh, and that's always a very useful way. I think permanence and impermanence is maybe the best kind of duality, uh, because that's where we tend to go the most wrong, or that's the easiest way to actually see through things. Uh, obviously things aren't permanent, yeah, relationships or whatever, so it's kind of obvious in a sense. Uh, so yes, so that's true. So you see that see everything in terms of those general characteristics, especially impermanence, uh, I would say. Uh, and uh, then uh, the uh, the other side of things about uh, turning it inward. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, uh, you know that that is o often al also true. Yeah, that you actually want to kind of see your own where you're coming from, what are, what is driving this whole process that you are looking at. Uh, and the more you see that, uh, of course, the more you will be able to. Uh, let go because you understand that this is actually coming from the wrong place. It's very similar to, you don't really need to go beyond the idea of the three characteristics because if you see things in terms of the three characteristics, your internal uh, response will also change automatically, right? Because that is part and parcel of the same thing here. So just go to those three characteristics and that will be sufficient to, in, uh, in this case. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, hi, Ajahn. Hi. Um, my question is regarding the fact to show compassion to people who you deem as evil. Mm. I'm just saying that like some people who are powerful want to destroy you. I mean, one example right, we have right now is the Ukraine war. Mm. Um, I mean, right now, because we are comfortable here, we can show compassion and stuff like that. I'm not sure if I'm the victim right now in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Would I have compassion for Putin? If I'm uh, uh, Ukrainian right now, I think I, I, want, I want, him, want him dead. I'm just curious as a Buddhist. Yeah. I mean, just yeah, yeah, in, in, yeah. you may put in such a situation, your life is destroyed, your family is dead. Mm. I mean, you have been a nice person all your life, and this yeah. is what happened to you. How could you show compassion? How could you have good... Mm will towards that person. It's yeah, very hard, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, so um, what, what you have to do is you just have to start in, the, in a small way and you have to not start with the, most, the biggest fish in the pond. Yeah? You kind of, that's the biggest fish in the pond pretty much you've chosen there. So start with the easy, easy ones uh, and then gradually work yourself up. And then uh, yeah, I, sometimes I, one, one way of looking at this, the one I think about the war in Ukraine, they think, first of all, okay, yes, you have Putin on the top, and you have the generals of the army, then you have the kind of lower officers, and then you have the ordinary soldiers. Uh, and many of these ordinary soldiers in the Russian army, they kind of just been recruited across the board as a young men in their late teens, early 20s. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. Uh, they've been recruited to the army like a killing machine, and often they're just cannon fodder to be killed in the fields. Uh, yeah? And I, how can they, and yes, they may do war crimes, uh, but they're also placed in a terrible position. They're just young men, have no idea what's going on. Uh, how can you not have compassion for these young soldiers? Right? Uh, this is like the first point. Even though they do atrocities, you also realize they are in an impossible situation themselves. Uh, they haven't really, they never really wanted to get there, especially the ones who are now conscripted and drafted because of uh, the, the needs of the army. Uh. And so that's the first step. And then you kind of, okay, what, what about the officers that are kind of commanding them? Uh, well, the officers that are commanding, they are also kind of trapped in a certain way. They're trapped by the higher officer, trapped by the whole system, yeah? Once you are in the army, you, you never, okay, you had to make a living somehow, maybe you had no other choices, you ended up in the army by random, for random reasons or whatever, and now you are kind of part of that system. And so you do things that, again, are evil, but really it's almost as if you... It's hard to get out, yeah? You are kind of trapped again in this whole thing, yeah? And gradually and gradually you kind of move it out like that until you end up with Putin at the very top. Eh? And you realize that he also, in many ways, is trapped, right? Eh? He has somehow got into power, probably got into, usually people get into power for the wrong reasons, yeah? because power itself is kind of very addictive or something. Yeah? And then you, uh, once you get into power, you get influenced in a certain way, you start thinking in a certain way, right? Uh, uh, nationalistic kind of tendencies become very strong probably. Uh, and somehow he, he's obviously deluded. He doesn't know what he's doing. I, I wouldn't want to be put in thinking in terms of rebirth. You know, where is he going to get reborn? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It, probably not such a very good place. Uh, so he, doesn't, he also doesn't understand what he's doing. He also is blind, yeah? And in that blindness, and this is kind of the tragedy, in that blindness, he causes so much suffering for other people. Yeah? But he himself causes suffering not because he wants to cause suffering. Yeah? He probably thinks that he's doing a good thing, right? It's just blind. It's just darkness. It's just delusion all the way through. Yeah? And this is kind of the problem with these kind of situations. Every, we're all hurting each other because we're all deluded, because we have no idea what we're doing here. And that's kind of what's going on. You look at society, look at the animal realm, for example. The animal realm is the strong destroying the weak, eating the weak all the time, right? But how responsible are those animals? If a lion kills a, you know, a smaller animal, is the lion evil? But you argue it's following its instincts. So you wouldn't call the lion evil. Putin is also following his instincts. Yeah, that's kind of the point. We are all kind of more like robots than we are individual autonomous beings. And once you start to see that we are more like robots, we're more like traffic lights going red rather than you know, someone being responsible. Once you get that, it kind of takes away, even though they are so destructive. So instead of having compassion just for the victims, you, you, at least you are neutral towards Putin. It's okay, hard to have compassion for him. Okay, I agree. But at least be neutral towards him, yeah? How can you be angry with a robot? So this is, this is how you start to think. Well, remember, the biggest problem here is the illusion of a self, right? The reason why you think someone is evil because they have a self. They have decided to do these bad things. 
That's why we make them responsible. If someone doesn't have an independent choice, how can they be responsible? Something like that. That's how you gradually move in this way. Yeah? It's not easy. And most people, in, many people are going to be angry and upset. It doesn't really help the situation. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, uh, Jan. Hi. I uh, just would like to check for somebody that we don't know and they behave in a certain way that's quite destructive. Mm. I'm not talking about the war, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, destructive to the community. How can we find the good in somebody that we don't know? Yeah. You know, just yeah. like, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I yeah. can't even find a piece of cloth, you know, along the way. <laughs> 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 yeah, un unless I dig very deep, yeah. yeah. So my yeah. question here is that yeah. instead of looking at that, why not I look into myself? Yeah. Maybe it's my ego trying to justify it for me to mm. react. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of times actually when we react, we tend to be very defensive. Protecting our ego, I think. Of course, yeah. yeah. No, of course, that's yeah. a big part of the problem. Yeah. 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 So, end of the day, um, yeah. is justifying and finding that good thing yeah. going to diffuse the naughty behavior or bad behavior? You don't have to. Th if, as you say, if you don't know them, you can't see the good things. So, mm. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, don't, don't try to see the good things. But in that sense, just have compassion, yeah, and understand. Just like with the previous question, just understand that. Uh, they are more like robots than uh, autonomous beings. Uh, it's the delusion of a self, that, that's why we kind of make them responsible. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of a universal, you can universalize that, yeah? It's true for everybody. And because it's true for everyone, then uh, uh, it's something you can use in all, all situations. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, build that up and then eventually you, you don't feel any ill will anymore, uh, yeah? What what do you mean? I can't remove the person. Yeah. The situation. Yeah. This situation. Should I remove the whole committee? <laughs> can't be. Yeah. Can't be. Yeah, so now, I mean, this is this is the other thing. One thing is how you deal with things in terms of how you think about it. Another thing in, in practice, what do we do? That's a different situation. Uh, yeah, two two different things. Uh, and how what what you do in reality that can be anything. Yeah, that there's no kind of right or wrong in that area. The only thing that's right and wrong is what what you bring to that, what kind of quality do you bring to it. Uh, so even if you don't want to kick out the whole committee, you have to <laughs> do it with kindness and compassion. Yeah, That's the only thing that you should always think of. Uh, but in terms of what you do, there often isn't any right or wrong. It's just how we do it that matters. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anjan, um, is there maybe an extension of just now you said, uh, good people has good effect. Let's overturn that. Huh? So if I experience bad things, mm -hmm. is it because of my karma? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if bad things happen to me, it's because I deserved it? Yeah. Uh, because of my yeah. things which I've done in the past? Maybe. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see it like yeah. that? It also includes yeah. like that. Yeah. Let's widen it further. Yeah. If I'm very ill, Bodily, yeah. did I do something in the past to, to become like this? Is yeah. that how you see karma? You, you did one bad thing in the past. Uh, yeah, w one bad thing, getting reborn. That was your bad thing that you did. Uh, that was a, <laughs> it's a very bad idea. So, <laughs> so the, the point is that a lot, you know, it's interesting how the Buddha analyzes this because he talks about all kinds of causes for why we suffer in the present day, uh, here and now. Uh, and karma is only one of a number of things. Uh, illness is another one. It's actually separated out. It's separate from karma in the, in the uh, suttas. Karma can also be the cause of illness, but illness has often nothing to do with karma at all. It's a completely separate thing here. And so the, the problem is that human life has a naturally coming with it all kinds of things. You know, you, one of the problems, for example, is being careless. Careless is different from karma. 
So if you go to, into the town, not in Singapore, but in Singapore may be very safe, but if you go in the wrong city, the wrong place at the wrong time, you get assaulted. It's not because of karma, it's because you were stupid. Yeah? <laughs> and so, and the same thing here, if you walk into the street, yeah, I'm going to check my karma, see if how good my karma is, and the car comes and kind of kills you, then it's not because of karma, it's because you were silly walking into the street at the wrong time. So the, the, the reality is that, uh, you know, karma is only one aspect. A lot of things in life have got nothing to do with karma. Human life has a lot of things to that are unpleasant. Uh, yeah, you lose your job, you get divorced, you break a leg. All of these things are natural part of human existence. Uh, and so you cannot really say it is karma. It may be karma in certain circumstances, but it's very hard to divide things up into karma and non-karma. The danger with attributing things to karma is that people say this is your fault because you did bad things in the past. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, that is completely not, that's a complete abuse of the Buddha's teaching. That is not the way to think about it. Uh, so the, uh, because the point is that we have all done bad karma in the past. Uh, sometimes things come out, sometimes they don't. Uh, and the reason we do bad karma is non-self anyway. It happens because of cause and conditions. Uh, so if someone is suffering, whether it was because of bad karma or not, you should always have compassion. Yeah? Because our own karma is just waiting to ripen anyway, before we know it. And then we need that compassion. So we cannot call, be, call ourselves superior or inferior because of these things. This is just a kind of evolution of things, things driving on. And this is one of the really silly ideas in Buddhist communities, the idea that you don't have compassion because someone else did it in the past life. It's kind of crazy idea of thinking. That is completely wrong. We all do bad karma sometimes. We all make mistakes sometimes. And just because someone has made a mistake does not mean they shouldn't have any compassion for them. Mistakes is part of being human being. So, um, yeah. You okay with that? Yeah? Okay, excellent. In Buddhism, the principles of morality have to do with your motivation, what drives your uh, actions. Uh, yeah? So action is good, morally good, uh, if it is derived from purity of mind. Uh, if it is derived from impurity of mind, then it's a bad action. Uh, that is the ultimate answer. So why do you do things? Uh, what is your motivation for doing something? Uh, and if you're motivated by kindness, compassion and wisdom, uh, then you know that it is a good act. Uh, if you're driven by ill will or whatever, it's bad. Uh, so motivation is the final answer. And what that means is that when we look at ethics from a Buddhist point of view, then it actually opens up a large number of possibilities. Uh, yeah, it means that there is no absolutes when it comes to abortion, for example. And this is a very important ethical consideration, has always been. It is much more gray, right, in, in what is bad or good. Euthanasia, is it okay to have assisted suicide, for example? In Western Australia, we have an assisted suicide law. It is now legal to have assisted suicide given certain conditions. Yeah? Stem cell research, is it okay? Is there consciousness there or not? All of these questions become nuanced and they become potential for having a debate about it. It is not something that is set black and white because the Buddhist system of ethics is actually very, very flexible. And so we have found in, in Australia that whenever we engage in the debate about ethics, as Buddhists we have far more interesting things to say than any, any other religion. Yeah? We can actually contribute something to the uh, to the discussion, whereas the other reason, well, they have their things in black and white and there's no, no way out of it, uh, whereas we can actually contribute something sensible to the discussion. Uh, and this is the beauty, one of many, many, many beautiful things about Buddhism uh, that makes it really unique among world religions. Uh, it's just completely different, yeah? If you look at all other world religions, they are far more black and white and, uh, and uh, Buddhism has a certain flexibility built into it that is very, very useful. Uh, I don't want me to say anything bad about other religions. I, I usually come across as kind of, kind of a Buddhist chauvinist, I think. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, personally, to me, anyway, I, that, that's the way I tend to look at things. Uh, yeah. But do you think in that situation people will get confused about what, what stance to take? If you are confused, then keep to the five precepts, yeah? 
This is why we have different layers of ethics in Buddhism. So five precepts, easy to know. But if you want to go a bit deeper than that, you want to really understand what ethics are about, you go to the motivation behind it. So stick with what works for you and what you're able to deal with. Actually, even, even with the five precepts, right? Um, from yeah, what I know, yeah. the Mahayana Buddhists hmm. and the Tavan Buddhists hmm. can have very different interpretations to some of the things like... It doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, so with the two different schools, sometimes yeah. they have different interpretations of the precepts as well. Mm. Um, especially when it comes to like sexual misconduct. Mm. So, from what I know, the Mahayana school is saying that you know, premarital sex is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's against the five precepts, and then um, Theravadan school. Buddhist, uh, yeah, some some of the, from what I've heard, they would say that it's um, basically anybody who's under the protection of the family, of the father or brother, you know, or that you know you you, you shouldn't do anything to to the person um, to keep harmony in a community. So then you know there's also a bit of difference in the interpretation. Yes. Yeah, there is different interpretation, and especially the one about sexual misconduct is a very, um, is a tricky one because it seems to be socially bound, bound by the society you're in. It's not actually an absolute rule. It, you know, sexual misconduct means it shouldn't be hurting anyone. That's really what it means, uh, and that might be different in different societies depending on the kind of relationships you have with people and things. Uh, so I would say that. Uh, is open for interpretation. I don't think there is any absolute rule against premarital uh, sex in Buddhism. I don't think that is part part of it. Uh, but it's really how you how it de how it affects the people around you, uh, and that will depend on your parents' understanding of these things, how they feel about these things, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so it's kind of very, very, uh, very varied, I would say. Uh, but uh, in general, I don't like to think in terms of Mahayana and Theravada. I just think of early Buddhism and later Buddhism. That's kind of my, my idea. So I always ask myself, what, what does the Buddha have to say about this? Uh, that's kind of my, my idea. And uh, because Theravada is in many ways also a later development, they have all kinds of things that are later. Mahayana has all kinds of things that are later. But so what is the common source that we all have? The Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> Important. <laughs> So, anyone else want to say anything? Yeah. Another one over here. Do we? How does the microphone work again? Or it's working. Okay. Um, Ajahn, um, I think similar to this situation where um, you talk of the ethics system, or what we, we if we talk about the ethics system as in engraved in the stone out there or it is a, more like a evolving, a constantly changing, a, a theoretical framework for us to navigate the world. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's an internal thing uh, versus uh, something that is written explicitly outside. So likewise, I think the understanding of karma and dependent origination, mm. there's also this problem of whether it is really out there in the world and we happen to observe it, or whether it is a theoretical framework that we adopt to understand our experience. Yeah. And uh, of course, you have a different picture of it, depend on your need to solve your problem. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's my uh, uh, the understanding I have it now. Uh, rather than trying to figure out, oh, it must be like this, uh, it must be outside like this. Mm. Uh, any uh, interpretation will be wrong. Um, mm. Then we, we fall into the same, same trap as uh, engraving the laws out. Yeah, the stone. yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I think that almost always the... Uh, Almost all in, everything in Buddhism should be interpreted as an internal thing, as an experiential thing. Yeah. It is experience that matters. Uh, and it's the same with Kamma. Yeah. Kamma is, should be experiential. And the way that Kamma is experiential is simply feeling what happens when you do something bad. Yeah. They talk about Kamma <coughs> in the three lifetimes. So there's Kamma that experiences in this lifetime, the Kammas whose results are experienced in the next life, and Kammas whose results are experienced beyond that again. Yeah. So what is the kamma you experience in this life? Well, mostly it has to do with the mental effect that your actions have on you. Huh? 
Yeah? So you do something bad and you feel bad about yourself. Do something good and you tend to feel good about yourself. Uh, and that's how you really know karma. And of course, because in the long run, do many bad things, it kind of depresses you down. Of course, then it will lead to a bad rebirth because your mind is already low when you die. You have dragged it down through your life. And this is how then it carries on into the future. Uh, so that, absolutely, so I think personal experience is the one that really matters at the end of all of these things, and that's kind of important. And the laws that we use to understand it are never more than approximations to, to that reality. Uh, and as such, they can still be useful, but they are, that's what they are, they're approximations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ajahn. I want to follow up with my question just now regarding the two suttas. Yeah. Uh, so can we? Because just now uh, you mentioned different approach for different uh, desire, right? Yeah. So can we still establish that the uh, methods that uh, Buddha mentioned is uh, universal to all sensual desires, or we still have different ways of dealing different desires? It is universal, but uh, th I think the point is that uh, you know. Um, different desires have different effect on the mind, yeah? and some are more serious than others. Uh, and it's important to kind of see what is really problematic and what isn't. Uh, it's like anger, you can say all anger is dealt with in the same way. But there's some anger that are very small. You might get irritated with someone. Okay, it's very hard never to get irritated with someone. But to get really irate, yeah? really kind of very, very angry, is a different thing. That is much worse. So you, you start off by dealing with the big defilements. Yeah? You start dealing with those things that really are problematic. Yeah? So like desires, if you have very strong attachments, for example, those attachments are going to lead to enormous suffering in the future. Yeah? Yeah, we bond with someone, for example, in a very kind of strong way, yeah, and then we are asking for trouble because of that. Yeah. So we ask ourselves, well, what are the big attachments? What are the big problems that we have? Yeah? And even the desires aren't worse. The attachments are worse. The attachments are derived from desires. Yeah. And so you use contemplations like you find in the suttas, like uh, everything I own uh, is everything I think I own, actually I only borrow. Yeah. Yeah, all sensual things in the world are actually just borrowed. They're borrowed goods. So once you start to think about things as borrowed rather than owned, it changes your entire attitude to them. So for example, if you have a house, maybe you're, I don't know if you're attached to your apartment or, what, or maybe your iPhone <laughs> or whatever it is, right? It's kind of impermanent. It might get be gone tomorrow. Yeah, Maybe you won't be too concerned. You find another one. doesn't matter so much. But... Uh, that there are things in the world that we are very attached to. Relationships is an obvious one, right? And of course, they too must end. All of these things have an end. You're borrowing in that relationship for a short while, then it's gone. It's a harsh reality, right? It's, it's, I mean, Buddhism is about seeing things squarely, not pretend that they're other than they actually are. But all of these things are borrowed. And so then you ask, well, what is it that is not borrowed in this world? Is there anything I own that I don't really borrow? And the answer is your kamma. The kam Buddha says you are the owner of your kamma. It is also in the really long run, that too is borrowed, uh, but it's more owned than anything else uh, because you bring that with you for a very long term. Uh. So instead of then focusing so much on all the things in the world, we focus more on how it is that we live. Uh. The how is really the significant part. Uh, yeah? So you start to live. You can live much the same way, but you focus more on how you do the things uh then you're in business. Uh, so look at the big problems in your life. Don't focus on the small things. Know what actually are your real problems. Uh, if I get a little bit irritated, okay, that's not a big deal. If I get really angry, okay, that's a problem. If I have super strong attachment, okay, that's a problem. Eating food, okay, not such a big problem. Uh, yeah? <laughs> and then you kind of get things and prioritize things in the right way. Uh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, PJ over here. Yeah. Uh, Ajahn, I just wanted to, uh, it's more of a comment, uh, because I think that there were some comments and questions about like how do you generate compassion for somebody who's like evil and all that. Yeah. And what you mentioned about the ownership of karma, um, I, I think that in my mind when we get irritated and annoyed at something, it's as though that we are... We are um, we're getting caught up by something external, mm -hmm. but we're also not drawing a clear line of like who's owning what karma. Because the karma of like what Putin has done is his karma, mm -hmm. but 
when we get irritated or annoyed mm. or if we generate compassion and all that, that's our karma in reaction mm. to that. Mm. So that ownership of karma, I think that you mentioned, is a very important tool for us to mm. figure out like what karma do we want to generate towards thinking about like somebody like Putin. So mm. it's just my, my initial reaction. Right. Good, yeah. Good point, yeah. All right. One at the, at the back, back there. Yeah. It's five o'clock. I'm happy to carry on a little bit more if there are some few more questions. So please uh, see how see what happens. Uh, Ajahn, I think I'd like to ask something. I think this one will apply to everybody. Yeah. Uh, let's say we go to a seafood restaurant. Yeah. Okay, we see, we choose a live crab. <laughs> uh, you know, to, to, to eat. Yeah. Is, is, is it a breach of the first precept of killing? So does, you know, killing just yeah. that crap for our own as a food, yeah. uh, is it applied to passioner or just applied to the monastics? <laughs> it's probably not a good idea, yeah, if, if something is live, because in a sense you are saying that must be killed. That's kind of what you are, that is the implication of yeah. that thing, you're right? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, um, probably not ideal, yeah? probably not kind of the best way. I, how bad it is, uh, it's difficult to say. I, I would argue that probably best not to do as a Buddhist if you can avoid it. Uh, that's what I would say, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah. You have a question? Hi, John Hello. Hi. Um, sorry if we find my question rude. Uh -huh. uh, this is very new here. Uh, my understanding of what I've learned so far about Buddhism mm -hmm. is we are trying to stop rebirth, mm. right? But my next question would be, main question is, how do we even prevent birth in the first place? I mean, I, 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 I can't find answer for that one. Yeah, because... Yeah. Uh, you know, we are trying to prevent uh, hmm. stopping wanting and all that. Like Arjun Brahm says that, you know, let go, you know, stop the want. It's the one thing that makes us want to, to English to be reborn again. Hmm. But how do we get this wanting? It's because we are human. That's why we want wanting. Hmm. That's what I was thinking. Then how do we become human in the first place? Hmm. So, you know, it's like, I, I, you, you know what I mean? It's like, we, it's almost like, <laughs> <laughs> By accident, we yeah. just appear yeah. here, and then suddenly we have to find how to get out. Yeah. But how do we come in in the first place? Yeah. Why do we acquire this? And so I'm sorry. Well, well, the, well, the, way you, the reason you come in is, uh, you know, the, you try to learn from that reason why you got in here, and then you try to avoid the same mistake in the future. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah? How, 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 yeah. how do you do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, now we are yeah. really here in this situation. How do we stop one the one thing? Yeah. But how do we come? How do we appear in the first place? So you know, we were introduced yeah. to this um, material goods and all that, the worldly things. Mm. But if we weren't even brought in here, we wouldn't even be attached to it in the first place. So mm. who brought mm. us here you, to you, be attached? You brought yourself here, yeah. How? Yeah, how? Yeah, how yeah, yeah, but how yeah. did I bring myself here when I didn't? When I wasn't supposedly. Human before that, because you have to be human not to yeah, want, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah. can't. Yeah. Well, the thing is that as long as you have desires, you part of that desire is the desire to exist, and that desire to exist will drive you on to get reborn yeah, somewhere. But how do you? Be, how did you possess a desire to exist? Only when you're human, then you can desire to exist. Right? No, no, no. Yeah. Every 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 kind of being has a desire to exist. Doesn't every matter whether you're human or not. Being. being, yeah, yeah. So even if ghost, if you were a ghost, I don't know what you were before you were born as a human, but let's say you were a ghost, yeah? Okay. So do you think, I think you may have been a ghost? Sorry? I, do you think you may have been a ghost before you were human? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but to be a ghost, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Ghosts so too have desires, yeah? Ghosts too want to live, ghosts don't want to, what? so when you... Yeah, so it's like... Yeah, yeah. yeah. The origin of things? Uh, yeah, origin of things. Yeah. Craving, desire. Yeah. So the, the thing is that mm. you, the reason that you get reborn into human life, the reason we get reborn to any life, uh, is because of desire. Desire has always been there. Uh, always been there. Uh. There's no what? first point of desire. Where's the origin of desire then? How do we. There is no first point of desire. Yeah, so that's my point. Once you reach Nirvana, probably you come back again then. 
Wouldn't it be? There is, I, I don't say that. I don't see that. Is, I'm not saying there is no last point. I'm saying there's no first point of desire here. It's different. Okay. So there, even though there is no first point, it is possible to make it come to an end. Yeah. Right. That's the difference. Sir. The That's <laughs> too deep for me. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> No, it, it, it's not that. It's not that deep. It's just that you have to. The thing is that it, what it takes, it takes insight and understanding. Yeah. Okay. So if you get an insight into the fact that it is not worthwhile getting reborn, if you get that insight, and that's possible to get, says the Buddha. If you get that insight, then you desire will disappear. It is only because you think it is worthwhile to get reborn. You think it's worthwhile to carry on existing. That's why you have the desire. Once you see that it is not worthwhile. The desire will stop by itself. Yeah, but that's stopping the reborn. But what stops? Yeah. The, what prevents the born itself? The same thing. Reborn and born is the same. Yeah, no difference. It's the same thing. Yeah. Right. You okay. remember? Sometimes people have this idea that we are born because of our parents. Yeah, our parents kind of are there, and because of that, the baby arrives, and this is what produces birth. No, what produces birth is not that. What produces birth is craving. Yeah. So they w true, there will be someone reborn in that family, huh? but it won't be that person who ended craving in the previous life. That person will not get reborn. Huh? It will be someone else instead. Huh? Yeah, that's reborn, but born. I'm still asking for you. Born, I still can see it. It's the I same thing. Born and reborn, same thing. Yeah. There's someone, no difference. Someone, yeah. every, every instance of being born is an instance of being reborn. First life, is that what you want to know about? What, what, uh, uh, the very first life? Exactly, probably like, you know, so I'm quantum yeah. physics, like they said, from yeah. nothing becomes something, that means from something you go back to nothing. I mean, Arjun Brahm says yeah. from no when, when what omega becomes zero, you become nothing. That's why, that's uh -huh. how it starts. But, so, but uh -huh. from nothing, that becomes something as well, under physics, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, I don't know. So I, like, I, I think that physicists don't really know. That, that, I don't think that... I, anyway, I think that the point is that there is no first birth. That's the point. Uh, there's yes. another, always another birth prior to the previous one. Huh? There is no first birth. That's and that's the same thing as there is no first craving. There is no first ignorance. Uh, there is no beginning of the universe. Wow, there's no beginning of the universe. No, no, it's not, there's no discoverable beginning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good luck with... Uh, Good luck with that one. See what happens. <laughs> can, can I just share like my uh, thoughts on this question? Because uh -huh. I've actually entertained this question for a very, very long time. Um, so then I came across this quote that um, from Bertrand Russell. He says that the idea of things, the idea that things must have a beginning, is really due to the poverty of our imagination. And then you know, like I thought, I thought about how, you know, it's really beyond. Um, our capability to understand, perhaps due to the limitations of our five senses or six senses, you know. So then I also thought about the handful of leaves sutta, which, okay, I may, I may be mis misquoting, but basically the Buddha was, you know, uh, with one of the disciples and there were a lot of leaves on the floor and he picked up a handful of leaves and he told his disciple, likewise, there is so much knowledge in the world, there's so much, so many things to learn about this world, but are they useful? Do they lead to the understanding of suffering and the cessation of suffering, to, to understanding what's true happiness and towards true happiness? And he said that, um, so likewise, you know, th there's so many leaves, right? So there's so much stuff that you can, you can know about the world, but it's not useful to liberation. So then, um, likewise, the, the handful of leaves that he's holding are the teachings that he has taught to the Sangha that will lead you to the final liberation. So, in a sense, we, we don't have to entertain ourselves with too much thoughts about the origin of the world and whatnot because it doesn't lead us out of suffering. And then there's also another analogy that comes from um, Chinese Mahayana side of Buddhism. It gives an analogy of a burning house. So it says that when the house is burning, do you stay inside the house and question yourself, how does the 
fire start? Why did a why is there a fire? Who started a fire? What caused the fire? And all these questions. You don't do that. You run out of the house. You get out of the house. So you liberate yourself. So you prevent yourself from getting burned in this burning house. So likewise, samsara is this burning house that is not meant for us to stay in. Um, so we should find ways to get out of this this samsara. And then, yeah, the rest of Ajan, on the question on the river, maybe the Agana Sutta would be a good start. Agana Sutta? Yeah. 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 The Agana Sutta says uh, it is about the origin of the world, uh, and the origin world starts with the end of the previous world. Uh. That's kind of cool. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of gives you an idea of how, th how things are in Buddhism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I don't know whether I get it right or not. I think there's three craving. Craving for assistance, craving for uh, karma, uh, sensual pleasure, and craving for, I think it's non assistant I don't know whether, is it, is it correct? The three craving. Mm. So the three craving actually is the obstacle to the liberation. Uh, yeah. So I think, uh, I don't know whether is it help your... <laughs> The three, <laughs> the three cravings are yeah. the uh, cravings that cause yeah. rebirth, c cause suffering, right? Uh, craving for yeah. future assistance, craving yeah. for yeah. current enjoyment. Yeah. This is the definition the craving of craving for the, like aesthetic yeah. that yeah. go for the torturing mm. of the body. Mm. I think there's three cravings. Yeah, and that, one of the sutta I think they mentioned this. This is the four noble truths, right? This uh, is the uh, craving for the cra that leads to suffering in the future. Yeah. Uh, the cause of suffering. That's what uh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the, so craving actually. Yeah. Uh, there's one sutta they said there's three craving, so I, I hope it can help her <laughs> about the some uh, understanding. Of course, I cannot manage to <laughs> help too much. Uh, this is what I know. Okay, uh, there's three craving. So craving actually, I think that in the child dependence origin is uh, the way to break free. So uh, this link of samsara, I think the craving is uh, the main thing that we have to break through. Uh. So if she can break through the craving, then she'll be out of samsara. <laughs> <laughs> Is that answering my question? <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. I think we come to the end. I think. Come to the so end okay, of yeah, the call retreat. Call it a uh, call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, everyone. Uh, Ajahn, may so we request to uh, uh, yeah. share the merits as sure. well as a uh, Let's share the merits. Blessing. And then we will do the uh, Arahang Sama Sambuddha to finish off. So we'll just yeah. uh, so thanks everyone for coming here. This is the best way to oh. celebrate Christmas, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing is better than this. So this is wonderful. So very, we should be very happy to the Christians uh, that they have this holiday so we can all come here and do Dhamma stuff. Uh, <laughs> so it's marvelous. Thank you, Christians. <laughs> Okay, so let's do the sharing of the merit uh, together. Uh, and uh, so here we go. Hidang men yatinang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Hidang men yatinang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Edang men yatinang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Okay, we'll give you a Christmas blessing. Yeah. This is also a blessing for Rong Hui, who is birthday today. It's right, Rong Hui. Oh, happy birthday. It's, it's also Venerable Sambodhi's birthday today as well, actually. So, it's, yeah, so. <laughs> So, lots, anyone else's birthday? <laughs> no. 
Jesus, no, 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 Nati me saranang anyang, Budo me saranang varang, Ete na sachava, Jena sote te hotu sabada, Nati me saranang anyang, Tammo me saranang varang, Ete na sachava, jena sote te, otu sabada, nati me saranang anyang, sango me saranang varang, ete na sachava, jena sote te, Hotu Sabada Sadu 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 Okay, let's just finish let's. off by doing the Arahang Sama Sambudo together. Huh? Let us pay respect to the venerables. Thank you, Brother Sunket. Can you lead the Ajahn and uh, uh, Bante uh, somebody to the library to have some uh, tea? <laughs> tea? Uh, the rest, can I have one minute for announcements? Okay, tomorrow we have next segment, exciting segment, Christmas Day. <laughs> okay, we have... The topic are uh, going against the stream, of course, by Ajahn Brahmali. <laughs> and 2 p.m., don't forget to stay back after lunch. Uh, do bring a dish for potluck, uh, if you like, or uh, for dana as well. Uh, then you will have lunch here, or you can have lunch outside, and come back at 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. More obscure suttas you need to know. Okay? And Ajahn Brahm will be here, here, here in Singapore, okay, here. Uh, at Choi Hulin Club on the 28th of December. Uh, 2 to 6 is a half-day meditation uh, retreat. Um, and then uh, uh, 7 o'clock, I think he will be signing his uh, books. And 7.30 will be a Dharma talk on the antidote to fear of the future. Okay, but uh, you need to sign up, and uh, uh, as long as there are vacancies, the the yeah uh, at Choi it will be open. At the moment, I think we have already got four hundred over people, so I think we can only take about six hundred people. I don't know because they are only giving us two uh two halls instead of three halls. So let's see how many we can squeeze in. So do register early if you want to, uh, um, attend. Okay, in memoriam, okay, give, uh, uh, do uh, uh, share merits with your beloved uh, 
departed relatives. Oh, don't have to keep the cushions. Tomorrow we'll be using it. Okay. Uh, Sis Sylvia will be leading it. And uh, Ajahn Brahmali will end with some words of wisdom and uh, sharings, which is uh, pre-recorded. He just recorded it for us. So do sign up for uh, the in-memoriam uh, service here. You will be um, offering some flowers and uh, uh, names of your departed relatives will be read up as long as you sign up before 28. So there's only three more days for you to sign up. Uh, you can still sign up up to 31st, but their names will, won't be read out because we won't have time to put it on the slide. Okay? I think that's all. Uh, can I check? Uh, next. Okay, after this, Ajahn, Bra Ajahn Brahm will be zooming in on the first, first 3 p.m. Do come here. He will zoom in to us uh, from Perth. Okay? So 3 p.m., not... Not ten thirty, okay, for, for the first after after tomorrow, uh one one week's time. Okay, next. Uh Dharma Foundation course for those who would like to join the, the uh to learn more about Buddhism, uh do join every Saturday, one thirty to four. Uh it'll start uh soon, uh next next month, uh first week of next month. Sis Sylvia will be teaching uh, most of the sessions, uh, I think Brother Chai Chai will take a few of the sessions. So this is part one. There will be another part two. Okay, do sign up. And help us build our Dharma home. We are already... Uh, we need... Uh, in the next three months, we need your money. <laughs> 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 to pay up. <laughs> Okay, after we sign, we need money in the next, uh, within the next three months to pay out. Six million dollars, okay? Uh, thank you so much, everybody. See you tomorrow. Uh, good evening. Thank you.